Hello, everybody. Good morning. I hope everybody is fine. Right. I think yesterday, some, I don't know, I think Friday was the day we met, right? But we see only Harita, Nandakishore, Neha, and Sashank. Only four of you are there, right? Fine. Uh, what do you want to do, people? Anything you have in mind? Sir, can we start biomolecules, sir? Uh, we cannot start a new chajyo chapter karna because we have only four of you, right? I know the strength is around 15, right? Not even half the strength is there. Right? So that would not be a good idea. Anything else? Your exam got over. Chemistry exam got over. No, sir, I'm time. from different schools. Uh, so oh, oh, oh. When my is your exam then? starts uh, next week to next week. Uh, next week to next week. Okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, fine. So then maybe um, for DAV it's over. Okay, fine. For DAV people it's over. Midterm is over. Okay. How was the exam, Harini? How was chemistry exam? Was it easy? Good? Difficult? Sir, it's going to start for me, sir. Okay, okay, fine. Harini, how was the exam? It was moderate. Okay, okay, fine. Anyways, so maybe I will start. We'll just tomorrow try to revise, right? But um, having a one and a half hours of class, I'm thinking whether we need to have because we have less number of people. Uh, let me clarify. One second, hold on. Okay, guys, the class will be for only one hour. Okay, not one and a half hours because very less number of people are there, right? Okay, so maybe we will just start. Okay, right. So now let me ask you some questions. Let me see if you can answer, right? Say, um, can you tell me what are the applications of Henry's law? Or I'll say state Henry's law and its applications. If I ask you this question, how will you answer this question? First, state Henry's law. And then we'll talk about the applications next. How will you define Henry's law, people? Constant temperature, the solubility of a gas in a liquid is directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas present above the surface of the liquid. Huh. Okay. So 95% uh, correct. So what did it tell? The solubility at obviously constant temperature, right? The solubility of a gas in the liquid is directly proportional to the external pressure, not the partial pressure, right? It is directly proportional to the external pressure supplied, right? Now it's very easy to understand, right? Say I have a liquid, right? Now I have, I'm going to have a gas getting dissolved into this. So if I supply more pressure from outside, obviously the gas will be more dissolved. That's what it says, right? 
Fine. So basically solubility X is directly proportional to pressure and this pressure is external pressure, not the partial pressure. Okay. So we write P is, P is directly proportional to X. X is nothing but solubility. Right. And obviously we write P is equal to KH into X. All these things should be there in the um, answer which you're going to write. Okay. And this KH is what is called as Henry's constant or Henry's law constant. Right. This we know. Fine. What are the applications? What are the applications of Henry's law? Three applications are there, I think. Right. What are the three applications of Henry's law? Infused in sharp drinks. Sir. Ah, right, aerated drinks. How when aerated drink is used? Sir, by uh, applying pressure and uh, dissolved uh, to apply pressure to dissolve the carbon dioxide in the drinks. Ah, right. So you have to tell that the aerated drinks bottle is sealed under very high pressure. Right, it is obviously that's why when you open the say Coca Cola or something, you're seeing a lot of fuss coming out. Right, yes, so these bottles are sealed under high pressure. Why are they sealed under high pressure? Is obviously because under high pressure only carbon dioxide then dissolve in soda water. Right, you have to tell that carbon dioxide dissolves in soda water, and this happens only at high pressure, and that is why the bottle is sealed under high pressure. Okay. Okay. That is first application. Second application. Sir, uh, in high altitudes, the oxygen level is very low, sir. So, uh, why oxygen level is low? Sir? I, at high altitudes, oxygen level is low. So, we, we find it difficult to breathe. I understand. Why oxygen level is low? Low oxygen causes climbers to become weak. And no, it's very simple. Oxygen is dissolved in air. Is it not? O2 gas is dissolved in air. Right. Yes, so sir. obviously, when I go, yes, tell me. No, sir. Yeah. So oxygen gets dissolved in air. So obviously, when I go higher and higher and higher altitudes, the pressure keeps on decreasing the atmospheric pressure I'm telling you, right? The pressure keeps on decreasing, right? So if the pressure decreases, solubility decreases. So obviously the amount of oxygen dissolved in air decreases. That is why we feel suffocated. We are not able to breathe. This is how you must tell, right? You must tell as we go higher and higher, the atmospheric pressure keeps on dropping. Since the atmos atmospheric pressure keeps on dropping, the amount of O2 dissolved in air is also keeping on reducing. Right. Thereby, obviously, when I go higher, when I go to higher altitudes, I find difficult to breathe. Okay. This is how you must tell. You must tell that oxygen is dissolved in air and I go to higher pressure. The pressure is less. Solubility is less. Very simple. Right. Okay. Third one. Third application. Scuba divers use a right ah. Yes. Helium instead of nitrogen because helium has low solubility in blood. Mm -hmm -hmm. Correct, and correct, correct. if nitrogen is used, then there is a physical condition called bends, a painful okay. condition called bends. And uh, uh, to avoid this Understood. effect, we use dilute helium. Understood. Understood. Yes, that is what is called as uh, bends. Like that, that's the application. Right. Okay, so that's about Henry's law and how the application goes, right? And people, you can remember all the formulas relating to your uh, solutions chapter, right? Say so first is this P is equal to KH into X, Henry's law, right? And then I have uh, Raoul's law. Raoul's law is PA is equal to PA not XA. PB is equal to PB not XB and P total is PA plus PB, right? This comes from Raoul's law, right? And then I have uh, only one thing that is your Dalton's law of partial pressures, right? So that says P 
T that is oh, sorry not P T P A is equal to T total. I'll write Y A. Same way P B will be equal to P total into Y B. Now this is for Dalton's law of partial pressures, right? Now I have mole fractions here X A X P and X A and X P. Here also I have mole fractions Y A and Y B. What is the difference here? There also mole fraction, here also mole fraction, right? What is the difference here? Okay, can, can you define Raoult's law first? Then you'll understand. What, how do you define Raoult's law, people? Yes, tell me the definition of, tell me the statement of Raoult's law. Yes, please go on. Sir, for a um, solution of volatile liquids, mm. the vapor pressure of the component of uh, solution is directly proportional to its mole fraction. That's it. Mole fraction, that's it. Right. Fine. Anybody else? Anybody else wants to try? Raoul's law. Okay. See, this is how you must tell. If at all you you can take down also. Please take down Raoul's law, people. For a solution of volatile liquids. For a solution of volatile liquids. The vapor pressure of one of the liquids, the vapor pressure of one of the liquids. Sir, uh, can you say it again? Yeah, sure. Sure, sure, sure. For a solution of volatile liquids, a solution of volatile liquids means the liquid liquid mixture. Both the liquids are volatile in nature. Okay, so for a, a solution of volatile liquids, The vapor pressure, the vapor pressure of one of the liquids, the vapor pressure of one of the liquids is directly proportional, is directly proportional to the mole fraction to the mole fraction of that liquid mole fraction of that liquid in the liquid phase that is what that is what is more important mole fraction of that liquid in its liquid phase Okay, so I'll repeat the statement again, people. For a solution of volatile liquids, the vapor pressure of one of the liquids is directly proportional to the mole fraction of that liquid in liquid phase. Right? See, please understand. Now, when I take Raoul's law, right, say there are two liquids assuming A and B. Right? Now, obviously, this A and B, A will be in liquid phase and A will be in vapor phase. A will, B will be in liquid phase, B will be in vapor phase. Is it not? So what they are telling the vapor pressure of say, for example, PA is directly proportional to XA and XA is in liquid phase, right? How much amount of liquid is there in the liquid phase? I do not care about the vapor phase here in case of Raoul's law, right? The mole fraction here is mole fraction in liquid phase. That is what is more important. Obviously, the, the when I put the constant, it is going to come like this, that I know. Right. Now, that is about Raoult's law. What is Dalton's law? Dalton's law is very simple. Dalton's law says, uh, if I have a mixture of gases, right? If I have a mixture of gases, say two, three gases are mixed. Okay. The total pressure, 
right? The total pressure of the system is directly proportional, not directly proportional, is equal to, right? Is equal to sum of the individual partial pressures. Okay, the total pressure of a system, if I have a gas, if I have two, three gases present, right? So the total pressure of these three, two, two, three gases is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of the three, three gases. P1 is the first gases partial pressure, P2, P3 is the second and third gases partial pressure. Okay, right. Now, so that is what we write it like this. Now here, this YA and YB, since you're talking only about the gaseous phase here, this YA and YB are the mole fractions in gaseous phase, right? So basically you have to take the mole, the vapor here and you have to check how much amount of A and how much amount of B is there for Dalton's law. For Raoult's law, you have to take into account the liquid phase, how much amount of liquid A and liquid B is there. For Dalton's law, how much amount of vapor A and vapor B is there is what is the thing. Right. So between XA and YA, this is the difference. For Raoult's law, it's liquid phase. For Dalton's law, it's gaseous phase. Okay. So accordingly, you might you must you must, you must wisely use your formulas. Ninety percent you'll use only this, right? But I can ask you questions from this also. I think we have even solved questions based on that. Please check your notes if you've taken down notes. We have to, we have solved problems like this. Okay. So that is about uh, Raoult's law, right? Okay, so now next question is, for a solution to be ideal, what are the conditions? There's something called as an ideal solution, right? Okay, so for an ideal solution, what are the conditions? It should be, How will you tell? It should be Raoult's law. Okay, obviously first one is Raoult's law. And... Uh, the rule of Raoult's law over the entire range of composition is called uh, ideal solution, sir. Ah, that's what Raoult's law must be obeyed at all concentrations. Obviously, that's what I told yes, you. Raoult's law must be obeyed. Okay. Then other guy said del H mix should be equal to zero. Then and total cohesive force is equal to adhesive force. Ah, okay. That becomes later. Uh, before that, del H mix, there's one more, right? Del what? Del V mix. Ah, del V mix, right? Equal. Or if this is if this is an equation, you must tell that enthalpy of mixing is zero. Same way, you must tell volume of mixing is zero. Okay, and obviously the last point is adhesive forces must be equal to the cohesive forces. Right now, what do you mean by an adhesive force? Adhesive force is basically between solute and solvent. Force, the force between the attraction between solute and solvent. Cohesive is between solute, solute, solvent, solvent. Right. So cohesive is the force between similar particles, similar species. Right. So solute, solute, same, same. Right. Solvent, solvent, same, same. But adhesive is between two different particles, solute and solvent, right? So for an ideal solution, before well, I mean before mixing, whatever the forces I have, right, should be equal to after mixing, because after mixing only I'll be getting solute and solvent, because these two will be separate now, right? Solute and solvent will be separate before mixing. Only after mixing, the solute solvent interactions will come, and these solute solvent interactions should be equal to solute solute plus solvent solvent interactions, right? Okay, good. Fine. So that's about ideal condition. I mean, uh, so how do you, how do you, I mean, what are the conditions for a solution to be ideal? Right. And obviously, I know if I go to a non ideal solution, I can have two types one showing positive deviation, the other showing negative deviation. You know, again, what are all the conditions I should write for a positive deviation and negative deviation? Right. Okay. Say so now, next thing is what is my azeotropes? How will you define azeotropes, people? What are azeotropes? They are and what are inside? Mixtures. They are mixtures no. which, which cannot oh. be separated by distillation process. Okay, fine. And the, any, any other uh, point you want to add? Sir, uh, hmm. sir uh, azeotropes are actually binary mixtures having same composition liquid and vapor phase and uh, their boiling point is constant. 
correct like that's that's the little better way of putting it right so now what you have to understand is right say i have liquid 1 liquid 2 separate separate right now what happens is when i mix these two right i am i expect l1 l2 basically solute solvent kind of interaction should be there that's what i expect right but as your drops what happened is this becomes an entirely different system this behaves as if this is another liquid l3 right this behaves as if this l1 l2 should be solute solvent but no this is going to act as if it's a separate liquid again right so this will have one boiling point right if it is going to be l1 l2 obviously they'll have say bp1 and bp2 Right, but since it is going to behave as, a, as a, behave as if it is going to be a single liquid component present, it will have one constant boiling point. Right, so as said, these binary liquid mixtures are going to have same composition in the liquid phase as well as in the vapor phase, and obviously they are going to behave as if they are going to have be a single component mixture. Right, and that is why we will not be able to separate them with the help of distillation because the distillation process, the basic principle is difference in boiling point. Right, hope you know, like for whichever has the lower boiling point will boil first. I can collect them in the liquid form. Whichever is having higher boiling point will still stay in the in the in the in the side in the side in the, in the side which you start boiling. Right, so basically, since I the the entire process is based on difference in boiling point. Now, if this particular uh, system is behaving as if it's a single liquid having a single boiling point, I will not be able to separate them. Right? Okay. What are the types of azeotropes? Two types of azeotropes. Minimum boiling and maximum boiling as well. Right? They are, they are minimum boiling and maximum boiling azeotropes. Right? Now, according now, what kind of non-ideal solution will form minimum boiling, and what kind of non-ideal solution will form maximum boiling acid? When it has negative deviation, it forms maximum boiling Absolutely. and when it has positive deviation, it forms minimum boiling. Absolutely true. Very true. Right now, this is fine. Can someone explain me how is the why is it like this? The solution showing negative deviation is is called as a maximum boiling azeotrope. The other one is called a minimum positive deviation is showing by minimum boiling azeotrope. Can someone give me an explanation of why it happens like this? Now. If you want to answer this, say, let me go for positive deviation. Right. Now, what are the conditions you will write for positive deviation from ideal behavior? What are the conditions you'll write? You know, right, for ideal solution, you write, uh, that is for ideal solution, I know PA is equal to PA not XA, PB is equal to PB not XB, del H mix is zero, del V mix is zero. Like that, what are the conditions for positive deviation? Hmm. What are the conditions for positive deviation? Positive deviation PA should be greater than PA not. XA. That's it. Everything greater sign. PA is greater than PA not XA. PB is greater than PB not XP. P total is greater than PA not XA plus PB not XB. Del H mix is greater than zero. Del V mix is greater than zero. Okay, so these are all the conditions for a solution to show positive deviation from Raoul's law. Okay, right. Now, what do you see is happening here? Say, for example, I take the liquid A. Right. Now, what I understand is, if it was an ideal solution, it would have been PA is equal to PA not XA. Okay. Now, what I understand is that the vapor pressure I have in reality Right, the vapor pressure which I have in reality 
is more than what I expect. Expected is PA not XA, right? This is expected value. Right? Now, this is my observed value. That is what I see in reality. Okay, so PA not XA is the expected value, what we expect. And but what I see in reality is PA, which is greater than what is the expected value. Right? Now, obviously, if the vapor pressure is high, obviously the amount of vapors would have been high. Right? If vapor, vapor how will vapor pressure be high? Obviously, if, the, if there is more and more amount of vapor, then only more and more amount of vapor pressure. Right? So what I understand is this particular solution right this particular ab solution right can easily go into vapor phase why because it's a observed value of vapor pressure is greater than what i expect right that means what it can go easily into vapor phase so that there will be lot amount of vapors present thereby i have increase in vapor pressure right so now the what do you mean by they can easily go into vapor phase that means with less temperature itself, I will be able to make them go into the liquid vapor phase. We get the point, right? Since they are able to uh, form a lot of amount of vapor at high vapor pressure, right? That means what? I will be able to convert A in liquid to A in gaseous phase very easily. And when I say easily, I'm talking about less temperature. I'm talking about less temperature. And very simple, right? And that's exactly what we want. Now, positive deviation are the one which are showing minimum boiling azeotropes. Means what? Their uh, boiling point is lesser than L1 and L2. This L3, right? This L3 boiling point will be lesser than L1 and L2's boiling point. That is what you understand. That means L2, L3, that is the azeotrope, will easily go into the vapor phase. Okay, guys, understood. How is it forming? How positive deviation is uh, showing minimum boiling azeotropes? Is it fine? Yes, okay. Right. I hope everybody understood this. Right. Same goes with your maximum boiling also because you will now tell that it is lesser than what I expect. So obviously, it is becoming more and more difficult for the a, a liquid A to go into the vapor A. Thereby, I have to supply more temperature for it to go into the vapor phase. That's why they are forming maximum boiling azeotropes, right? I hope I made some sense to you. What is the time, people? Okay. Right, so moving on. So that's about uh, this thing. And obviously, the next point would be to uh, the four colligative properties, right? Elevation and boiling point, depression and freezing point, relative rolling of vapor pressure, and then your uh, osmotic pressure, Right, all these things are there. I will just write the formulas, people. Uh, del P divided by PA naught is equal to XB. This is what is my relative lowering of vapor pressure. Okay, but when it is going to come to problems, you do not have to use the formula. You directly use only Raoult's law. You will get the same answer. Okay, so whenever vapor pressure problem comes, Right, I would say it is better to use Raoult's law. Okay, not relative layering of vapor pressure. This is just a colligative property. Right. Okay. Now tell me, guys. Uh, fi okay, fine. First, we'll write the formulas. Then I have delta T B is equal to K B into M. M is the molality. Delta T B is the elevation and boiling point. Now this is my elevation in boiling point. Right. Then I have delta Tf is equal to Kf into M. Now, this is my depression in freezing point, Fp. And at last, I have pi is equal to C into R into T. This is my osmotic pressure. We all know the formulas. Right. Now, the question is, what is the application of colligative property? Where do we use colligative properties? First thing, how do you define colligative property? First, tell me that. What are colligative properties? Sir, colligative properties, sir. 
Hmm. Yes, qualitative properties. Yes. What is the definition? Sir, uh, sir it is a property of solutions uh, which depend on the number of solute particles uh, uh, other than the uh, chemical nature. Sir. Uh huh. Okay. This is like uh, partially correct. I mean. Yeah, the overall statement is fine, but that is not how this this like this is right in the exam. Say if it's a two mark question, I'll give you one mark. How will you properly say it? Independent of nature of the material and okay. dependent on the amount of solutes. Ah, that's the better way of looking into it. Hey, right. so colligative property is a property which is independent of nature. right but dependent only on amount of substance present okay so colligative property is independent these are the properties which depend only on the amount of substance present and it is independent of the nature of the substance present basically how I, in a layman's language how, how do i put it is i don't care what is there i really don't know what is there all i care about is how much is there right say in a, in a, in a group of 1000 people obviously i don't understand whether um whether it's a men or a women or what is their name right all i need to understand is how many people are there 1000 people are there okay accordingly i have to make arrangements this is all i need that is an example for a colligative property okay right fine this is what is colligative property and these four are the colligative properties relative lowering of vapor pressure elevation and boiling point depression and freezing point and osmotic pressure right now the question is what is the application of colligative property what do we use it for what do we use colligative properties for Hmm. Sir, are you asking the uses or types of colligative property? Uh, types are already there. Four types are there. What is the use or application? Application means use. Sir, to determine Sir, the application, we don't. We don't know. So we are not. No, no, yes, no. Sir. I think so. You, you are telling correctly. What are you telling us? Correct. I think. Sir, ask me a question. Yeah, it was Surya Muthu, right? Sir, it's Nanda Kishor. Oh, sorry, sorry, Nanda Kishore. Yes, Nanda Kishore. Yes, you tell me what we're telling is correct. What was it? Osmotic pressure to determine osmotic pressure. No, 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 no. It's very simple, right? All the colligative properties are used for determining or finding the unknown molecular mass of a substance. this is the thing right i give you a test tube right say i give you a soil solution some solution is there in the test tube right i really don't know what is there i don't know whether it's nacl or kcl or some some chemical i have some solution i have okay that's the beauty of colligative property even though you don't know obviously if i know what is there i know what is the molecular mass right if i know it's nacl i know it is going to be 8.5 that i know right but if i even don't know what is the uh, uh, substance present right with the help of your colligative properties i will be able to find what is the molecular mass of the solute i would say now instead of substance i write solute in a solution right it is used to find the unknown molecular mass of a solute in a solution even though i don't know what is the solute obviously if i know what is the solute i know the molecular mass i can calculate by writing the atomic masses right but if i don't know what is the solute still i will be able to find what is the molecular mass okay so that is the application of colligative properties right now from the uh, let's see all the right hand left hand side terms delta p b by p a not delta sorry delta p divided by p a not delta t b delta t f the uh, uh, this pi all these are measurable quantities that means you can measure them in with the help of some instrument obviously temperature you can measure with the temperature i mean thermometer right uh, this pressure values you can do with the help of something called as a barometer right so all these four things which are there 
all these are measurable quantities right so with the help of these measurable quantities right i will be able to find what is the molecular mass now it's very simple to understand right say now pi value i know for example i can i can measure it temperature obviously i know r is a constant right so in the concentration term look at this concentration nothing molarity right number of moles of solute divided by volume of solution right now in number of moles what do i have Mo uh, given mass of solute divided by molecular mass of the solute now see the molecular mass picture comes here right so now if i know the pi value if i know the temperature and if i know obviously r value i know right so definitely you will be able to find what is the molecular mass of the solute same goes with molality here molality here again in mole fraction also you will get molecular mass right so that is the application that is the application of osmotic sorry uh, colligative properties yes understood now can i get a yes is it okay Yes. No. Ah, yes. Okay. Cool. Good. Good. Right. So now, uh, next question is, right? Next question is, out of these four colligative properties, right? Which one is the best one? When I say best one for finding the molecular mass, right? I want to find. I say I give you a solution, right? Now I want to find what is the molecular mass of the solute because I don't know what is the solute. Right, which method you will use out of these four, and why? Which method you will use? Can you repeat the questions? What I'm asking is, I give you a solution, right, and I want I want to find what is the unknown molecular mass of the solute. Okay. Right, so obviously you are you going to use colligative property to find that. Which colligative property is the best to use, and why? In the in the out of these four, which one you'll use, and why? Or which is better to use? So related to my paper. For uh, mm -hmm. osmotic pressure, sir. Okay, that's the answer. Osmotic pressure is the one we will use. Why? Out of these four, why osmotic pressure is the best one? Sir, uh, because it's easier and the uh, the formula to uh, use the uh, osmotic pressure to find the molecular mass is more accurate. Mm -hmm. No, not like that. Two reasons are there, sir. Uh, because, uh, sir, in uh, the formula, pi equals uh, C R T, uh, R and T will be, uh, T will be uh, can be taken as twenty five degrees, and uh, R is constant, sir. So all okay. we have to do is uh, C, sir, concentration, and concentration is uh, uh, the number of uh, no no, uh, no, no moles no, no. of solution like you, by wait, the, uh, wait 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 you are little deviating. So you can tell that uh, T can be twenty five degrees Celsius. That is one temperature. Yes, sir. correct. Right now, yes, what about these two, delta T B and delta T F? Can I do it at room temperature? No. Ah, because now here I have to go to the boiling point that is increasing the temperature. Here I have to go to the freezing point. The temperature has to be decreased. Right. Yes, so obviously, uh, uh, this is this is fine. This is fine. But talking about these two, why compared to Uh, these two, that is delta T V and delta T F. How osmotic pressure is better because this experiment, or say whatever you want to do, can be conducted at room temperature itself. That's the first point, right? I don't have to go for increase or decreasing the temperature, right? That is the first point. Second point is that why is it that compared to this, that is your relative lowering of vapor pressure, why osmotic pressure is better is because of the value, in the sense. Here I am going to get very small values to work with, right? But what value I'm telling is this value, relative lowering of vapor pressure. This value, delta P by I mean delta P by P A naught, will be a very small value to work with, right? Obviously, smaller number, zero point zero three five something something like that. If I have, it's very difficult to work with, right? But if I go to this one, 
right? This is going to give me a finite good value to work with for calculation purposes, right? It is going to give me a little larger value to work with because pi value will be like that. Okay, the pi value will be little high if you measure it. Say it can be say it can be one point five atm or it can be two atm. Right? Look at the numbers here. Right? But here the numbers will be like a uh, zero point zero nine three seven something like that. Very very difficult numbers to work with. Right? But here the numbers are little solid to work with. So two reasons. One, osmotic pressure experiment can be conducted room temperature itself, unlike delta T V and delta E T F. And second thing is that. The, the value which I'm going to get is a little larger value for osmotic pressure than in the case of relative lowering of other pressure. Okay, two reasons. And this question is a very, not important question, but a lot of times this question has come in, in board exams. Why osmotic pressure is the best to find out the unknown molecular mass? They'll ask. And you have to tell two reasons. One is temperature, the other one is the value. Okay. Right, fine. And the last part of the chapter is going to talk about this Van Toff factor. I, okay, Van Toff factor. Right, I. Right now, um, fine. This is okay. Like, what is the problem with colligative property? Right. So since we have some problems with colligative property, basically the calculation which you're going to do, right is uh, going to the molecular mass value which you're going to get from the calculations of the colligative property the molecular mass obtained is a wrong value sometimes not every time right sometimes it might be a wrong value why it might be a wrong value people the value of molecular mass obtained might be a wrong value why from the colligative property Sir, uh, because uh, abnormal solutes are present, sir. What do you mean by abnormal solutes? Sir, uh, abnormal solutes are uh, solutes uh, that will show uh, the experimental value of the solutes will not coincide with the uh, theoretical value. Sir. Absolutely. That is what I'm asking. Why? Why is it that the experimental value and the observed value are not matching? What is they basically on? There is one problem with colligative property. If you look at the definition and try to understand, right, then you will get to know the answer to this question. It doesn't depend on the nature, it is independent of the nature, but all I need is the amount of substance present. So now what can you tell about it? What is what what can be the problem? What can be the problem then with colligative properties? Okay, so what happens is since my colligative property doesn't know, doesn't care what is inside, right? Now, generally, when I take a solute, right? Now, solute uh, will be in the form of solute, that's it, right? Now, say for example, uh, it doesn't like a colligative property doesn't care about the chemical nature of this, it doesn't know what is there, uh, what element is present, what compound, nothing it knows, right? Since it doesn't know. Right. For example, if I'm going to have NaCl aqueous solution, right? Now this NaCl I know will dissociate to form Na plus and Cl minus. Okay. But colligative property, what it understands is that I know this is same, right? NaCl will give me Na plus and Cl minus. It is same. This is just association, right? But what colligative property I will understand is that here I have only one molecule, right? But I actually uh, what happens is this is going the colligative property is going to consider NaCl as two different molecules because I'm going to have Na plus and Cl minus, right? All matters is the number. How much is there, right? We know that these two are same, right? But colligative property doesn't understand because it doesn't know the chemical nature. All it cares about is the number, right? So whenever dissociation or association is possible, right? Colligative property fails in the sense that it is going to give me a wrong value. 
okay so the term abnormal solute that's not a good term but what i understand from your term is that any solute which can undergo dissociation or association will obviously give me a wrong value for colligative not for colligative property for the molecular mass through the calculation of the colligative property okay i hope everybody understood right so for me to correct it right we go uh, we first we define your uh, this thing as say it's like this right say i know all the these things will become like this uh, the i will be included right so now to correct it we write del p divided by p a not is equal to i into x p right and we write delta t b is equal to i into k b into m delta t f is i into k f into m and pi is equal to i into c into r into d okay now it's very simple to understand that i will be defined as observed colligative property divided by calculated colligative property right so what we already know what is observed the right hand side whatever i have these are the observed values experimentally i can see it with the help of instruments that comes here observed right divided by calculated is this kb i mean that is i xb kb into m uh, sorry this one right without i right whatever the values which are here these are calculations which we do right both these should come equal but when i have dissociation association this two will not be equal <coughs> excuse me right so these two will not be equal so to make them equal i go for call the vanta factor i to be present here okay right now there is a for the case for the sake of problem solving people right i think we have mentioned this for the sake of problem solving we will define vanta factor as total number of moles at equilibrium right it is also defined as total number of moles at equilibrium now this is going to be helpful for connecting i with alpha alpha i know is your degree of dissociation or association for that matter it depends on the compound right degree of dissociation or association for that matter right so hope you all remember for example if i say i have mgcl2 mgcl2 will form mg2 plus plus cl2 cl minus right so if i start with one mole initially zero now this is a time t is equal to zero when i reach equilibrium say out of this one mole alpha mole should have reacted that is what is my degree of dissociation right what should come here guys for mg2 plus if alpha is reacting how much mole how many how many of mg2 plus should come Now look at the stoichiometry. One mole of this gives one mole of this and two moles of this. So if alpha moles are reacting here, I should get if one mole reacts, I form one mole of Mg two plus. So if alpha mole reacts here, here I must get. Alpha. That's it. Alpha moles. right so don't forget forget about this one out of this one only alpha moles are reacting so if one mole gives me one mole alpha mole will give me alpha moles yes right now same way one mole gives two moles of cl minus so alpha mole should give me how many moles of cl minus two alpha cl that's it two alpha moles of cl minus now these all these three you add this was i told you this is total number of moles at equilibrium so i is equal to 1 minus alpha plus alpha plus 2 alpha 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 gets cancelled i is equal to 1 plus 2 alpha right now obviously you have a formula i think alpha is equal to uh, i minus 1 divided by some formula you have i don't even know the formula right all this comes from this particular calculation only Okay, so now you have a direct relationship between alpha and i. This is it depends on the what kind of compound you have. For example, say I have AlCl three gives me Al three plus plus three Cl minus, right? Can you tell me what is the connection between i and alpha here quickly? Like just do what we did here. 
right? And tell me this kind of equation. What is the equation you're going to get for this? Quickly tell me. Sir, uh, just do same thing. One zero zero. Now here, obviously, one uh, out of this one, some alpha will react. Alpha. Here, what will I get? Alpha. Here, alpha. what will I get? Uh, alpha. Three alpha. Uh, three alpha. Right. So now I is total number of moles at equilibrium. That is one minus alpha, alpha. Plus, alpha plus alpha plus three alpha. Plus three alpha. Three alpha. Basically, I what I have is one plus three alpha. Yes, sir. Right. So, like this, you can need, don't forget, don't remember the formula. Formula might be sometimes confusing. Okay, you can always remember this. We in even in the class when we discussed, we discussed with this method only, and even did the problems on this. Okay, right. So now that is your Vanta factor, and that is how you connect them with your degree of dissociation. Okay. Now remember, guys. Sometimes in the question they will give, uh, they will not mention whether you have to use I or not, right? But depending on what is the solute used. For example, if they tell a solution of glucose or say sucrose, something like this, they tell, right? Now in this case, no I is needed. Why? Because glucose or sucrose, there is no dissociation or association. Right, but say if they give solution of say KCl or say MgCl2, something like that, right? You know these are capable of undergoing dissociations. So definitely in this case, I value has to be used. Okay, or they will tell a solution, um, non a solution of a non electrolyte. They will tell something like this. A non-electrolyte. Electrolyte is something which can give me ions. Okay. Electrolyte is something which can give me ions, obviously with dissociation. Okay. But when I tell you a non-electrolyte, obviously, again, you don't have to use the I value here. Okay. So you have to look at the question very carefully, right? Depending on what is the solute present, you will decide whether I value has to be used or not. Okay. Right. Now, say one more example we'll see for association. For example, say two BH3 molecules will, will combine together to form D2H6. Right. Now, say if I start with one mole here, nothing would have been there. Now, at equilibrium, if I tell you that alpha moles are reacting, how many moles of D2H6 should be there? Two alpha. Sorry. Look at this carefully. For two moles, I'm getting only one mole of this. So if alpha moles are reacting, I should get? Alpha. How is it alpha? If I have, if I have two, I'm getting one. If I have four, how much should I get here? Two. 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 So if I have alpha, what, what should we get here? Sure, alpha by two. Ah, that's it. Right, I should get alpha by two because two moles gives one mole half of it. Right, so obviously if alpha moles are reacting, I must be getting alpha by two moles of B2H6. Again, I is same, total number of moles at equilibrium, one minus alpha plus alpha by two. So what will it be? It will be one minus or one plus alpha by two. That is what will be my I value. This is equal to I. Okay. I think it's one minus alpha by two. Ah, correct. One minus alpha by two. Absolutely. Yes. Right. Because one minus alpha is one minus alpha by two. Yes. Correct. Okay. One minus alpha by two. In this, this is, this is association. Right. So you don't have to remember the formula guys. Okay. If at all you, you find that, that to be easy, please go with it. But I would really advise that these kind of things are going to be really helpful rather than remember already you have to remember so many formulas. Why that also? Okay. Right. So I think we'll stop with this for today, people. What is the time? Okay, exactly time, right? So we'll stop with this for today. Okay, uh, guys, uh, by next week, uh, your this thing will be over. 
your uh, what is that uh, midterm exam will be over but i think some of you said that by next next week only it's starting but for most of you i think for da you will it's almost over right and uh, so can we can we have the quiz next class that is we can we continue with p block we were doing group 15 group 16 and it's and stuff right can we continue that Yes. Sir, uh, next week I won't be able to attend class, sir. Okay. Next week only I have my exams. Exam. Last till twenty fourth. It will last till twenty fourth. Okay, fine. Then we'll see what is the strength at that time. Okay, depending on the strength, we'll decide. Okay. Any other questions anybody has? Also. Awesome. Okay. Sir, I, you, I, sir, yeah, I have me. one doubt, sir. Sir, can you explain me. that the process of sulfur? Uh, forming manufacturing sulfuric acid sir oh nothing nothing you just have to remember the uh, equation okay so basically from uh, its process of preparing sul sulfuric acid if you are from correct uh, yes, h2so4 sir. right nothing just remember the formula just remember our formula equation right and what are the conditions for example we say that uh, for uh, haber's process ammonia they tell that N two should N two plus H two giving two N H three. That's the equation, right? But other than the equation, all you have to remember is the condition. Say I require three uh, hundred degree Celsius temperature, six um, hundred uh, atm pressure, and F V should be there as a catalyst. I N should be there as a catalyst, right? Like that, there will be conditions. Three things or four things. One is the equation. Second thing is your uh, temperature. What temperature the reaction will happen? Second, the pressure. Third one is the catalyst. Okay, so these four things alone, you remember, you are done. No, but not nothing else will be asked more than this. Ah, oh, okay. So and okay. dimerization, what is that? That's what we now saw, right? Uh, BH three, two BH threes will combine together to form B two H six. That is dimerization. Two two individual molecules combine together to form one single molecule is what is called as dimerization. Basically, polymerization. What do you mean by polymerization? Once one substance gets up, get gets bigger and bigger, bigger by aggregating. That is polymerization. Dimerization means two. That's it. Very simple. One two molecules combine together to form one molecule. That is what is uh, dimer. Ex best example is BH three. Two BH threes will give me B two H six. That's the example. Okay. Sir. Okay. Any other questions? Anybody has? No. Sir. Okay, guys. Thank you so much. We'll meet again next week. Right, I'm ending the class. Thank you. Thank you.